Well, today we are wrapping up our series on the Sermon on the Mount. And it's taken us a few months. I think it's taken us two months to go, three, oh, three months, three months to go through it because we only gather this way once a week. We have only a limited amount of time to discuss it. But if we were open to our, our Bibles, to Matthew, we would see that it is only three chapters. It starts in Matthew 5 and it ends in chapter 7. But scholars actually agree that it probably took Jesus several days to teach this information to the people that had gathered. But these three chapters, 110 verses, are packed full of wisdom. Every word perfectly nuanced, every example thoughtfully crafted and used to teach the people that being a Christ follower isn't about being good enough. It isn't about just following a bunch of rules perfectly. It's not about what the Pharisees tell you to do. It's not about religion. Being a Christ follower is accepting the truth that Jesus is who he says he is, that his death and his life breathe new life into an old covenant, and that he has the ability to transform hearts and lives. So I'm going to read these last few words this morning. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 7, and you can follow along in your Bibles or up on the screen as we read that together. We're going to be starting in verse 24. And it says this. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and pounded that house. Yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded that house, and it collapsed. It collapsed with a great crash. I don't know, when I'm, when I'm reading scripture, I like to picture kind of what's going on, put like some art to it, I guess. So I was trying to picture the people maybe that were in the crowd over those past few days. And of course, there was probably the note takers, you know, the ones who were like, is there going to be a PowerPoint today, Jesus? Wait, can you just go back a slide? I think I missed one. And then, of course, there would have been the Pharisees and these, you know, educated teachers like this. Did you just hear what that Jesus of Nazareth just said? Can you believe he just said that? Huffing and puffing. Then there's also those whose derriere and eyelids somehow become connected any time they sit down. And you all know who you are. And then there would have been those who are hanging on every word who over the last few days they've been trying to download and compute and reconcile all that Jesus had just taught them with everything that they had known their whole lives. And Jesus doesn't conclude with, like, go get him, champ. Like, let's go, team. He doesn't conclude with, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. Not even an amen. He paints them this picture. Two houses, two builders, two foundations. And we're going to call builder number one, wise contractors are us. He sets out to build his house, and he decides he's going to invest in the foundation of the house. He knows it's going to take a little bit more effort, maybe a little bit more overall co cost, but it's not going to leave much time for the cosmetics in the exterior, but that's okay. He's not worried about those things. He knows that if he builds a strong on a strong foundation, that there's going to be stability and security in that. Well, the next guy we're going to call foolish builders are us. And he decides he's going to cut some corners, that it's going to save time and money if he just builds it on the sand that's over there. And he can use some of the extra money for the outside, for the landscape, for the cosmetics. He is more concerned about those things that people are going to see when they come to his house. Well, don't you know, a storm comes along, a hurricane, wind and pounding rain and flooding waters, and both houses are just battered from every angle. And wise contractors are us. He goes outside to see what's going on. And there's a little bit of cosmetic damage. But the foundation and the structure of his house are still standing. So he's going to be able to repair those little things. But now the house built by foolish, foolish contractors are us. It's been absolutely destroyed. There's nothing left. All that time and effort that he put into the outside, it doesn't matter. His house has been decimated. There's no repairing anything. It's going to require him starting over with a completely different foundation. Now, as Jesus is sharing this example, I picture him taking the utmost care to make sure that everything he was saying was really clear to the people there that day. He even uses an example of something that they would be familiar with, the building houses. And then I even picture him maybe having some tears in his eyes. Because everything that he has taught them over these past few days has been out of his love for them. 
he's been sharing from the heart of God about the heart of God. And he's been honest with them. Here's what it looks like to follow me, to be a citizen of heaven. The path isn't easy. Everybody's going to face storms. But then he provides this assurance who put their faith in him that they're going to be able to build on a rock and withstand any storm that comes their way. So Jesus' final words to the crowd kind of imply that they need to make a choice. Are you going to act on all the things that you've just heard over these past several days, or are you just going to ignore it? So there would be two types of people walking away from the hillside in Galilee that day. The person who said, yeah, I believe what he said. You know, it was really difficult to hear these things, and I'm still trying to process a lot of this information, but I'm really tired of doing things my way, and I really want to lean into this Jesus and see what this is all about. And then there would have been the people who sat there for days and listened to everything that Jesus had to say, but then they decided, eh, that was really informative. But, you know, I'm not really sure I'm ready to make any sort of hardcore commitment Doing, thing my, doing things my way, it's been working so far. So I'm just going to, maybe I'll just pick out some of the things that I liked, and I'll just try and use some of them, and that'll be good enough. But what he's saying is, guys, here's the facts. I'm telling you, take all your knowledge of me, and if you put it to heart and you begin to live it out, then you're building your life on a solid foundation. Or you can ignore it. You can continue to live your life your way. Or just try and use bits and pieces. But what's going to happen is that when a storm comes up, you're going to collapse with a great crash. What are you building your life on? Where are you going to invest? And the bottom line that I hope that we can kind of talk through and work through this morning is this. That building your life on Christ is an investment that can withstand any storm. I think it's safe to say that most of us know, know that. You know, we've, we hear it in church. We read it in the Bible. We even just sang it in the songs that we were just singing. In our head, we know that Jesus is a firm foundation. But for some reason, there's something that prevents us from taking that step to actually live it out. We don't actually want to do what's needed, and so we struggle through our life. And we try and build our lives on ourselves, on our own strength, on our own abilities. Or we try to ground ourselves in some other person or some other thing. A countless list of other things. Everything except for Jesus. And all of our attention and our intention is directed towards those things. Towards unstable foundations. We'll even drop everything or go out of our way or exhaust ourselves to, to fit our lives and mold our lives around th those things. And then a storm comes along. A hurricane, force wind of a medical diagnosis or a torrential downpour of disappointment from a, uh, a friend or a family member who let you down or a raging floodwaters of financial loss. And we are wiped out and we end up shattered and broken because we've invested everything. We went all in with someone or something that never promised nor had the ability to keep us from being destroyed. We know storms are inevitable. Jesus talks about it. He tells us, you're going to go through difficult things. And it doesn't matter who you are, whether you're a new Christian or whether you've been walking with Jesus for a long time. There are people and situations and life circumstances that the enemy uses to create storms because he wants to distract and destroy and to try and shake our foundation. But I want to say something about these storms because sometimes I've heard people, and it really makes me sad when I hear people say things like, um, my child is sick because God is punishing me. This storm is a, is a punishment. Or, um, you know, I haven't really been going to church as often as I should or doing what I should. So I have cancer because God is punishing me for this. God doesn't punish a parent by striking down their child. God doesn't punish us by giving us cancer or dementia or any other, you know, list of diagnosis because we didn't go to church. God doesn't make people lose their homes or their jobs. We live in a broken world. Everything has been corrupted by sin. And unfortunately, it affects all of us. 
We all share in that brokenness. So in a broken world, bad things happen to good people. In a broken world, people get sick, children die, marriages and families fall apart, people lose jobs and homes. But God doesn't cause this to happen. He allows it to happen. And we can get angry, and we can blame him. We can ignore him and become defensive. Or we can turn to him and put our trust in him. Because he promises us to, promises to carry us during those times, to be the solid ground where we can steady ourselves. I don't know if that's you this morning. Maybe you always feel like you're just being knocked down, like it's always a storm in your life, or it feels like nothing ever goes right, or everyone is always out to get you. And so you're angry, or you're blaming God, or you're defensive, or you just feel hopeless, like you have no joy and peace. You don't have to live like that. He's telling us right here that you can build your life on him, but you have to make the choice. And you can choose to invest in a relationship with Jesus, or you can choose to invest in living your way. But it's your choice. We have all the facts. We've listened for three months to the Sermon on the Mount. We, a lot of us come here week after week and listen to messages. We have the whole Bible. We know the beginning, we know how it's going, and we know how it's going to end. We have all the facts to make the right choice. He is not going to manipulate or coerce you into any decision. It's up to you. Where are you going to invest? Now, one of the definitions of investment is the act of devoting time, effort, or energy into a particular undertaking with the expectation of a worthwhile result. Now, I don't know about you. When I think of investment, I typically think of money. That's the first thing, like investment banking, which I know nothing about. But what I think it is is that people invest a whole lot of money into some things, hoping to get a whole lot of money back. It's not just something they throw a little bit of money at. They invest a large amount of their money into that, I don't know, Maddie would know. <laughs> but we also invest in things like our church. We invest in our families. We invest in our jobs. We direct large amounts of our time and our energy and our effort into those things that we care about. Investment, it isn't superficial. It's deep. It's going all in. But unfortunately, for foolish builders are us, he invested in the surface stuff. He was concerned with how the outside of his house would look to other people. You know, what we, people would see when they looked at him. So he invested into those things that he thought would make him look good. He made sure to go to a church and attend a Bible study and listen to Christian podcasts and listen, listen to worship music and listen to speakers at every Christian conference. He was a really great listener. Listening is a great skill, but it's not going to get you far in life. Because the knowledge of Jesus that he had never moved from here to here. It stayed superficial, so he only appeared like everything was okay from the outside. And when that storm came along, he had no depth. There was nothing for him to stand on. When we make that intentional choice to invest in a relationship with Jesus, it means we devote a significant amount of our time and our effort and our energy into getting to know him. We don't just go to church and listen. We start studying the Bible on our own. We take time to pray and to talk with God and to hear what he has to say back to us. We put the principles that we've been learning about into place, you know, loving people who are hard to love, giving generously, serving humbly. And as we implement these different principles and practices that are in the Bible, our heads and our hearts become much more aware of God's movements. And we see how faithful he is and how he provides and how he takes care of us and how he loves us. There is a bit of a cost when we invest in this relationship. It doesn't compare to the cost that Jesus gave for us. But the cost of following Jesus, it says this in Luke 9, 23 to 24. It says, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but, for, but whoever loses his life because of me will save it. The cost of following Jesus, of going all in, is denying ourselves 
it's surrender, it's submission. A daily decision to choose him every time, all the time, no matter what. And it's definitely not our natural tendency. Do you guys remember those what would Jesus do bracelets? I actually think they might be making a comeback, which is kind of cool because I, I kind of like to think that like Jesus is sitting right there whenever I'm in a situation going and <laughs> make sure I'm doing the right thing. I, I picture him there. Well, instead of what would Jesus do, we often replace Jesus with us. So what would Susan do? What would Kurt do? What would Tony do? What would I do? What would I want? And what that is is control. It's holding on tightly to our lives because we think that we know what's best for us. But that's so exhausting. When we only have ourselves to rely on, it's just overwhelming and heavy. And I know that you guys are not unfamiliar, and I talk about it a lot, but with my mom. My family is experiencing a little bit of a rainstorm. And physically and mentally and emotionally, it's a lot. And I could sit in that sadness and be overtaken by that hopelessness and live in that what if or why did God allow this? But I don't. I can't. I won't. The only reason that I'm able to stand here this morning and that my dad is able to be here today and continue to push through in these situations is because a long time ago, he made a decision to surrender all that he is and all that he has to God. And a long time ago, I made a decision, not as long ago as my dad, to surrender all that I am and everything I have to God. And it doesn't mean that some days aren't harder than others or there's no stress. But with God in control of my life, I don't have to rely on myself. My dad doesn't have to rely on himself. There's this unexplainable peace that comes from that. And I'm able to reconcile those things wrong thoughts in my head, the what ifs and the why is this happening and it's not fair, I can reconcile those thoughts with what I know in my heart. And I can look over my life and see how God has been faithful. He's been faithful in this situation and he'll be faithful until the day I die. And I have hope because this place isn't my home, my dad's home, or my mom's final destination. My foundation isn't built on me. It's not built on another person or something of this world. It's built on a supernatural God. And he holds me up when my legs are shaking. And he catches us when we fall. And he uses people to speak words of encouragement into our lives and wisdom into our lives when we're not sure what to do. I belong to Jesus. I can rest in that security and safety you, if you've made a decision, belong to Jesus. You can rest in that safety and security. It doesn't have to be overwhelming and hopeless and exhausting anymore. But the cost of investing in him is surrender. Acknowledge that our life isn't ours to begin with. It's only by his goodness and grace that there is breath in our lungs every day. That his plans far surpass any plans that we could have for ourselves. He knows and he wants what's best for us. That foundation isn't crumbly and unstable. It's strong and it's secure and it's been proven over and over again. And the best part of all of this, this the worthwhile result of our investment, is that it comes with a guarantee. Not much else in life is guaranteed. Don't they say like only death and taxes? I'm going to add laundry to that list, but... Verse 24, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell and the rivers rose and the winds blew and pounded that house, yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. It comes with a guarantee that when we take what we know about God and it moves to our heart, and we implement those principles into our lives that we're building on solid ground. It's not going to crumble from a smaller amount of rain, and it's not going to collapse in any giant hurricane that could be sent our way. He is always there. He is always strong. He is always secure, and we can always stand on him. Wise builders are us. 
he did have a little bit of cosmetic damage. And that's not unusual. Even as a Christ follower who is sure of their foundation, we're still humans, and we have these human emotions and human feelings. And so sometimes there are cosmetic fixes that need to be made. Someone who's experienced infidelity may need to rebuild trust. Someone who has suffered a loss may be angry, and that's an emotion they have to work through. Or a person who's endured a difficult relationship with their family or their siblings or parents, maybe they need to work on breaking down walls and that they put up to protect themselves. But it's so much easier to just make a little adjustment and a little, and a little fix when the foundation and the structure are already in place. Christ follower, Christ followers whose lives reflect Jesus are going to have an easier time making adjustments and repairs because the structure is in place. They know God. They live out his principles. And they've experienced his faithfulness over and over. Last week, Pastor Tony mentioned a song. He previewed it a little bit for us. And I'm not going to sing all of it because it is very repetitive. But if you grew up in Sunday school, you know what's about to happen. So feel free to sing along because I can't do the hand motions like I intended. So the wise man built his house upon a rock. The rains came down and the floods came out up, but the house on the rock stood firm. Then the foolish man, he built his house upon the sand and the rains came down and the floods came up, and the house on the rock went splat. Sand, my house, I'm sorry, sand went splat. And as a child, it was really fun to make a big splat. But it's not so fun to live it, and we don't have to. Because throughout Scripture, we see example after example of God carrying people through difficult circumstances. We have people in our church who have endured things that I can't even begin to fathom, and God has carried them through those things. And he has these promises in his word. It says this in Deuteronomy 31.8. The Lord is the one who will go before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or abandon you. Do not be afraid or discouraged. He goes before us. He strengthens us. Isaiah 41.10 says, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold on to you with my righteous right hand. He's conquered the world. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. And he's rescued us and he's redeemed us. He's rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the son he loves. In him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And he is our rock. Psalm 18.2 says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock where I seek refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. So just like this passage implied that the crowd that day needed to make some sort of decision or choice, we can end by asking ourselves that same question. Where am I investing? What am I devoting my time and my effort and my energy to? Is it worthwhile? Is it guaranteed? Because when we invest in that relationship with Jesus, it's guaranteed. He is the solid ground where we can build and we're going to be able to withstand any storm that comes our way. Would you pray with me? Lord, I thank you um, just for your faithfulness and your goodness that I've seen in my life, that I get to witness in the lives of so many other people in this church, Lord. And, but I know that there's probably also people here that don't feel that security. And they need help to know that you are there. So God, break down those walls that they have built up to protect themselves and just let them lay it all out there to you. They don't have to go through this life alone anymore. They can live with a very firm structure in place to carry them through very difficult times. Help them to know that in such a way that they can't run from it anymore, God. That they'll be so tired of living lives their way that they will just give back to you, give their life back to you because it belongs to you anyway. I thank you, God, that we can serve you, that we can trust in you, that you're secure and that you're strong and just for how you take care of us and how you love us. And I pray that each of us Make us that decision today to invest in you, to invest in that firm foundation. In Jesus' name.